Hi everyone, welcome back to another complete review by Mirror Lessons. This time I'm going to share with you all my findings about the Sony A6500. The A6500 surprised everyone when it was announced only 6 months after the A6300. While nearly identical in appearance and specifications, the new camera adds 5-axis stabilization, a larger buffer memory, and improves the overheating issue when recording in 4K. These improvements have allowed it to claim the title of Sony's flagship APS-C mirrorless camera. Because the 6300 and the 6500 are so similar in many ways, I will mention the former more than once during this review so you can get a clear idea of how these two cameras compare. With that said, let's get started. I've mentioned more than once in previous reviews that this camera, along with the Fujifilm X-T2, has the best autofocus system among mirrorless cameras, so no surprises here, this is my favorite aspect about the 6500. Single autofocus won't give you any problems in good or decent light conditions. The camera has a smile shutter mode and face detection, but it is IIF that really stands out. It is by far the best eye detection autofocus mode I've seen around. IAF works great in single and continuous autofocus. It uses a single face detection point and rarely misfocuses or confuses the eye with other parts of the person's face. It even proved reliable at a Comic Con event when mask and makeup didn't seem to be a problem as long as the eyes remain visible. Then we have the continuous AF performance. I used the camera for birds in flight, a rally race and other situations and it always delivered great results with an excellent keeper rate. The 6500 can shoot up to 11 frames per second with continuous autofocus. Up to 8 frames per second you get an uninterrupted live view with very short blackouts, which is useful to track fast-moving subjects. The buffer capabilities are also excellent. You can shoot for more than 10 seconds with RAW files, while with JPEGs it can last for more than 30 seconds with the extra fine quality and almost indefinitely with the fine quality. Then we have Touch AF, which, in my opinion, has been designed really well. For stills, you can obviously use the rear screen to change your focus point, but it also serves as a virtual AF pad when composing with EVF. It is precise and quick to use. Sony included clever settings like making only half or a quarter of the screen sensitive or enabling disabling Touch AF when working in vertical orientation. However, despite these useful settings, I prefer to disable the touchscreen when working in continuous shooting mode with the EVF. My nose ends up touching the sensitive part of the screen anyway and as a result, the AF point moves all over the place, confusing the camera and decreasing the AF performance. If you use your right eye, however, you won't have any issues. Perhaps my favorite use of the touchscreen is when recording video. Because the camera allows you to vary the speed and reactivity of the autofocus in movie mode, you can get as smooth and precise transitions between two areas simply by touching the screen. 
Finally, as you can guess, the autofocus is fast and reliable for video even when the subject is moving fast. As a final note, the AF face detection system of the camera can work with DSLR lenses and a compatible adapter such as the Sony LA-EF3 or Sigma MC11 for example. I had the chance to try a few combinations with the S6300, whose capabilities are identical. The results are good but don't expect the same speed and accuracy as with native E-mount lenses, especially with fast subjects. The performance can vary from lens to lens or adapter to adapter. Another point worth mentioning in my opinion is that many of these lenses are large, heavy and don't really fit the small body of the S6000 series. The A6500 features the latest 24 megapixel APS-C sensor and latest image processor. Needless to say, the sensor is one of the best currently on the market. Dynamic range is pretty good with lots of flexibility to recover highlights and shadows. You may find some color noise in the shadows, but it is just a matter of increasing the color noise reduction to get rid of it. The raw output is 14-bit, but it is compressed. Personally, I've never found this to be a problem. The sensitivity range goes from 100 to 25,600 ISO, and you also get an extended value of 51,200. The performance is really good, up to 12,800 ISO. According to Sony, the front LSI chip gives us more advantage to the S6500 when it comes to high ISO performance, but the only difference I noticed has to do with JPEGs and noise reduction. When set to normal, the S6500 produces slightly less noise in comparison to the S6300. You can tweak these straight out of camera JPEGs with different settings. One of the most interesting is the dynamic range optimizer that works in auto mode or manual mode up to 5 steps. Then of course we have all the picture profiles, called creative styles, that give you different options with more or less contrast and saturation. Some of my favorites are light and autumn leaves. Finally, the camera has additional options that you won't find on the S6300, like controlling the auto white balance under certain artificial light sources, two additional metering modes and the possibility to adjust the compensation for each metering setting. Video has always been a strong selling point of Sony mirrorless cameras and the 6500 is no exception. The quality is the same as the Sony 6300 but with one important difference. The camera can record 4K up to 30 frames per second. It does this with full pixel readout and no sensor crop. It uses 20 megapixels on the sensor, which is the equivalent of 6K resolution that is then downscaled to 4K. This ensures sharper footage and crisper details. You can choose and customize up to 9 picture profiles that are specifically designed for video. They give you more dynamic range, more color control and better highlight preservation in comparison to the creative styles for stills. Among these options, you will find S-Log2 and S-Log3 to record the widest dynamic range possible and color grade in post. In low light, the A6500 holds up very well up to 6400 ISO, but even 12800 doesn't look bad. One of the main complaints about the Sony 6300 is overheating when recording in 4K, which can happen often and is really annoying for someone who needs to record long sessions. Sony introduced a new settings on the 6500 called Auto Power Off Temperature. When set to high, the camera will keep recording even if the overheating symbol appears on the screen. I ran a side-by-side -side comparison test with the two Sony cameras and the setting does indeed allow the 6500 to record for a longer period of time. I was able to save four 30-minute clips one after the other, which is two hours of footage, but I could have left it running even longer. 
However, the S6500 does heat up a lot during recording and if you are in very warm conditions, it could still present some issues. That being said, it definitely offers an improvement in comparison to the 6300. Among the other things worth highlighting, we have the quick and slow motion capabilities in Full HD. You can record up to 120 frames per second and have the slow motion result read in camera. You can also under crank by choosing a lower frame rate. There is an HDMI output with a 422 8-bit clean signal, a microphone input but no headphone output. Finally, on the 6500 you can save an 8 megapixel JPEG from 4K footage, similar to the 4K photo mode of Panasonic cameras. I always have mixed feelings when it comes to ease of use with Sony cameras. There are things that I like, but others that I just find frustrating. The camera is dust and moisture resistant and fairly well built. I like the small form factor. With a prime lens, it becomes a very portable and lightweight APS-C camera. The grip is a little more prominent in comparison to the 6300, which makes it more comfortable with larger lenses. The camera offers a good level of customization. We have two handy custom buttons on top, I like the lever on the rear to quickly change between two different settings, and the function menu is very useful. One of my favorite features is the two memory recall options found on the main dial. I often use them to quickly switch between my favorite options for stills and my favorite options for video so that I don't waste time changing too many settings. The screen can be tilted up and down and I already mentioned touch sensitivity which is very useful for autofocus. However, it's a shame you can't use it for the things like taking a picture or navigating the menu. The viewfinder is very good concerning clarity, brightness and resolution, but I find it a little small. You can set the refresh rate up to 100 or 120 frames per second. Among the things I don't like, there is the rear control wheel. I find it moves too freely and is too sensitive. Many times it is hard to jump to the value you want right away and you have to go back and forth. This wheel is used for many things, controlling the exposure, changing the focus area position and scrolling through the settings and options. You have to use it constantly and it really undermines the user experience. The top dial also serves to change the exposure. It is better than the wheel but still not perfect. I wish Sony could have implemented a front dial which at least would allow me to control the aperture and shutter speed without using the rear wheel. The movie recording button is another annoying example because it gives you very little tactile feedback so you're never sure if you pressed it or not unless you use your nail. I wish you could configure the shutter release button to start recording when working in movie mode. The menu system is an improvement over the previous cameras mainly because there is now a title for each page which kind of gives you a better idea of where you are and if you are on the right page for the setting you are looking for. It has been reorganized as well, but there are still a few entries found in unusual places. Finally, we can talk about the Play Memories Store and the various apps you can download to the camera to gain access to additional features. Some apps are quite interesting like Digital Filter or Star Trail. However, I wish that some of these features were integrated into the camera from day one and for free. You have to pay $10 for a time-lapse app when every other brand includes that feature for free proves that this app store concept is outdated and should be reconsidered. Sony didn't put the 5-axis stabilization on the 6300, but it did on the 6500 six months later. Now, this is easily the most important difference between these two cameras, but to be honest, it is also the feature that disappointed me the most. Of course, if we are talking about lenses that don't have optical stabilization, the advantage is there. For example, with the Zeiss 55mm f1.8, I managed a sharp shot at 1 5th of a second with the standard 500, while with the 6300 I had to stop at 1 40th of a second. However, if we analyze the performance with lenses that have optical stabilization, the 6500 doesn't give you a big advantage at all, and in some cases no advantage whatsoever. 
At a longer focal length, the 6500 gave me a slightly better result, but the improvement is not even one stop. For video, my conclusions are similar. With static shots at both short and long focal length, the A6500's stabilization doesn't make a difference with optical stabilized lenses attached. The footage isn't perfectly stable and there is jittering. When panning, the A6500 does stabilize a little better, especially on the vertical axis, but again the difference is marginal. For more complex movements such as walking and following a subject, the 6500 does seem to do slightly better, but again the difference is not huge. The Sony 6500 is a great camera if we look at the sensor, the autofocus system and the video mode with its professional 4K quality and excellent slow motion capabilities. Like its predecessor, the design and overall usability is ok, but could be better. The small form factor is certainly appealing, but not every button or dial is well designed and the menu system is still confusing. Then we have the elephant in the room, the S6300. The two cameras are so similar in so many ways that the decision is not easy to make. The 5-axis stabilization on the 6500 only makes a difference with non-stabilized lenses. If you use Sony stabilized lenses, you aren't losing much by choosing the 6300, that is valid for video as well. The 6500 improved the overheating problem when recording in 4K, and that can be one reason, albeit an annoying one, to choose it over the 6300 if 4K video is your main priority. The 6500 also has better buffer capabilities and a few additional settings here and there, but if you are on a budget, I would not hesitate to recommend the 6300 instead, given the difference in price. And to be completely honest with you, I feel that Sony could implement some of these new settings onto the 6300 via firmware update, like for example the new menu system or the new metering modes. I also wonder if they could implement the overheating setting. Even if it wasn't as effective as on the 6500 for some other reasons, it would still be an improvement for a 6300 users. So, as usual, thank you for watching. Don't hesitate to leave a comment if you have any questions, please like and subscribe and see you next time. Bye bye!